last week, um, we uh, shared uh, some Bible verses with you. Everybody got to receive a Bible verse on a little piece of paper. And uh, I asked you to do something that was very, very strange, which was not to study the Bible this week. Instead of just glancing our eyes over the text and uh, rushing through it, we wanted the Word of God to do something deeper in people because the harvest comes through that, right? When the Word of God actually does something to you rather than just reading it. <clears throat> and so I asked if you would spend the week reading that verse over and over and over again, studying that verse to see what it meant. And in so doing, you would commit it to memory and it would become part of you. We talked about clinging to the Word of God and that that good soil, when the Word of God gets down in there and does something to us, those are the people that God will use to bring in His harvest. That's what the Word of the Lord says. And so I asked if you would take that verse home and, and share it, uh, study it, and then come back this week and share it with your church so you could encourage them. Maybe take a moment and, and without looking at the piece of paper, share the verse. And then take, if you are so bold, and I pray that you will be, uh, take a, maybe a minute or so. If God has spoken to you through that verse and you've learned and grown, uh, to share what God has done. I think you'd be amazed that if you do this, just this one time, you'll see what the Word of God can do. And you'll be hungry for more. Amen? Okay. So I want to I ask, I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask if, uh, I'm going to ask three people to come forward, any three, and come here and just stand in line here, if you don't mind, anybody. We need boldness here, guys. Boldness. Don't be afraid. I need three. As, uh, as one person shares and then finishes and goes back to their seat, I would ask that if one more could come up and keep the line going at three. Would that be good? I'm going to start. I'm not, not going to share mine. That'll be next week. Uh, but I'm going to share with you. Uh, I, I tend to take a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, Mike Gregoire. You guys know Mike? You guys know Mike, right? He couldn't be here with us tonight because he has to work, but it breaks his heart that he can't be here. But he did what he was asked this week, and he has shared with me, and he wants us to all hear what God's Word has said to him. So here is Mike, okay? Hey, Pastor Moses. Uh, this is Romans 3.24. This is the free gift of God's grace that makes us all right with him, all of us right with him. Christ Jesus paid the price to set us free. Now how that applies to me is because of God's grace and favor and kindness, because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross, I am set free from the bondage of sin. And God is so kind and loving to send his only son to die for me. If I was the only one in the world, he would have done that for me. And that's what that scripture means to me. Romans 3.24, and that's in the NIRV version. The free gift of God's grace makes, makes all of us right with Him, with God. Christ Jesus paid. Amen. For me, I had 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> so just cymbals alone do not create music. So you alone cannot bring love. However, if you are with love of God, that shares the love. So you can speak in many languages, and you all say love, but if you don't mean love, you got nothing. 
You're just an annoyance. So make sure that whatever you say, share with it from your heart. Because God is love. God is in you. So share God. Share the love. My verse is Hebrews 11.6. But without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I prayed about this this week, but as I was standing here tonight, y'all felt that river flowing through here right where we were praising. I just want to say that God's standing, he's pointing at our hearts, everybody in here and saying, not, I condemn you, not about the sin, even though that's important, and whatever that is, you take that to God. But he's pointing to pull forth faith in the hearts of everybody here so whatever you got to do. So if you're timid about doing this tonight, get up here and get, get under some of this because this is from God. It will set you free. Yes. And he is the rewarder. Now that's the part I don't really fully understand in this verse yet, whether he's talking about both eternal or, or temporal rewards, but I know he is that. And that he will prove himself to us as we stand forth and we boldly begin to clear from faith in our heart what he's put in our hearts. That's part of seeking him. And when we, when we turn away from what we've, turned our hearts to before that we thought and I, I'm somebody that knows about trying to do good to be acceptable to God and uh, you know I'm pretty sure everybody here knows that doesn't really work because he said not that it's bad he said oh, I've got a higher way I've got this way that declares you righteous so now you can seek me from that righteousness not to get that righteousness anyway I can keep on going thank you <laughs> <laughs> Moses, I'm old. I can't remember, so I got to. Uh, it's too important. Fine. All right. I got Colossians 3:13. Uh, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And uh, I had a lot of people I couldn't forgive. I was sick a couple of years ago, and people didn't do what I wanted them to do, even Christians. And so I got an attitude and. <laughs> And I didn't want to forgive them. And then the Lord spoke to me when I prayed about it. And he said, you know, everybody's from a different walk of life. They have different experiences. And probably nobody hurt you on purpose. So um, he told me that for my peace, I had to forgive. Yeah. Yes. And so I did that. And then the final one was through this week, I realized I have to forgive myself. Because um, I did a lot of things that led to my illness and um so now i'm ready to correct that and i've been doing that for a while but not with the consciousness that this gave me can you get my glasses honey and there's a reason why i asked that see thank you my love mine's hebrews 12:15. And the very first two words are looking diligently. But if you can look diligently at these glasses, they broke today. So there's only one lens, okay? A lot of times we're like, I want to serve you, God. I'll go to Africa. I'll go anywhere, right? Looking diligently. But we can't if we're only half-hearted. Amen? If our, if our vision is really for other things, the lust of the flesh, lust of, right? So my scripture is Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail, that means man or woman, if any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up, springing up, trouble you. Oh, but it's not just going to trouble you. There's a comma there. It says, therefore, many be defiled. So it, it's amazing that I'm right behind Paula because it goes kind of like tag teaming on hers. Amen. And so we've got to make sure that we do not allow this root. I can't do that for you, and you can't do that for me. And I can't walk around and correct all your glasses. I need to be working on my vision, what I'm looking diligently at. Amen? So we're going to just remember this. If we're looking diligently, it tells us in Hebrews 12, too, what we're looking diligently at. We're not looking at our past. We're not looking at other brothers and sisters critiquing them. We're not looking at the devil and what he's trying to do to us. We're looking diligently unto Jesus, the altar finisher and developer of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the spice, and the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. So look to him. He's at our finish line. That's how you can run the race. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any word of bitterness 
springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. But let it rather say that they're looking to you as you're following Christ, running the race, and that they can say, you know what? You're making a difference, and you're not bitter. You're better. Amen? Amen. God bless. Last week before service, Pastor Moses asked me how I was doing, and I told him, I'm just worn out. I work with uh, about 80 teenage teenagers, and they were all coming back. And when he passed the scriptures around, he said, some of these are going to speak directly to you where you're at. And sure enough, Matthew 11:28, 28, come to me, all ye who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. I laughed when I read my verse. And I thought some of you thought I was crazy in last week. But to look at those three words, weary means that you're tired, you're worn out. Burden, burden actually comes from a shipping term in the old Greek. It was the cargo that was put onto the ship that weighted down the ship. And so that is what, and when you're weighted down, when you are tired and worn out, he will give you rest. And that's perfect rest. That is easy street in the Greek. It is an easier life. And so uh, that's what he's given me. And this week, that has been both a verse that I studied and a verse I prayed back. And that's what I received. Amen. Well, the Lord gave me 2 Timothy 2.22. And um, it is, flee youthful lust. But follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call upon the Lord with a pure heart. And what really, spo what really spoke to me was the first word, flee. And I'm thinking of, of Paul. He's trying, you know, uh, Timothy was working with Paul in the ministry. And, you know, what would Paul say to, to a young man that's starting off in ministry? But what would Paul say to me? What would he say to you? He would say basically the same thing. He would say, flee youthful lust. It can be old man lust. It can be middle-aged lust. Lust is lust. And when lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. And what Paul was saying, that word flee there, it's just, it, it, can you imagine, imagine flee? In other words, it's run. Some translations, it says run. Look at your neighbor and just say run. run. You get temptation, run the other way. This is, this is something that is deadly. You know, how many of you have kids? You know, when you, when your kids go to put their finger in the light socket, you're like, you know, whoa, whoa, get back, get back, get back, you know. You slap them on the hand. They get their hand, their, their hand on the stove, and they're like, whoa, whoa, don't do that. And Paul was trying to get to, to, across to Timothy and us today as he would say the same thing. Watch, whoa, beware. It's deadly. It's poison. It's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. And the thing about lust, it's very deceitful. You know, we always think of the, the things that, that are really like, we know that's wrong. You know, definitely that's, oh, come on, that's wrong. But there's a many that, you know what the devil does? He, he's sneaky. He comes up with those things. That, that can't be wrong. You know, there's people that are addicted to watching TV. You know, they, they spend, and, and, and watching TV, but they're not doing the call. They have a great call to God on their life. And so they're, they're bound with that. With, 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 you know, they say, oh, it's not bad. It's just a TV show. Oh, come on. How can that be wrong? If it becomes an idol, it's wrong. If, it's beca if you put that before God, it's wrong. And so sometimes we have to search our heart and say, God, what do, you, what do I need to lay down? What do I need to do? Because I want everything that you have for me. And Timothy was going into the ministry. You, you have a ministry in your life. Go, you have great calls of God in your life. God wants to use you mightily. And the enemy will come along and he'll just get you off over here in this corner, sidetracked with that. Then he says, follow after righteousness. Now this, uh, this reminds me of the new man on the inside. You are born again. I hear so many people saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of this. I can't do this. You are worthy to. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're the righteousness Amen. of God in Christ Jesus. Start looking on who you are on the inside. Whatever you focus, focus on gets bigger. So we're always looking at our sin. To follow after something means to follow it. Follow after the inward man. 
and focus on him and he'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you let the inward man lead you and guide you, and that is the, the essence of Christianity, is to live your life from the inside out. So I'll leave you with that. God gave his only begotten son for all of us, all of our sins. If he never did that, we'd never be here right now. And that's what's so make everybody happy. And wow, he gave his only begotten son, only. Wow, that's just so sad right there. But he did that for us. That's how much he loved us. That's how much he loves us that much, that much. Amen. Take care. Romans 5.11 was mine. And it says, not only is this so, but we can boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have been reconciled. So I read that. And if you just take that at face value, well, it can mean a lot of different things. But with a lot of things in God's word, you have to take it in the context and, and read further and, and study. And I'm just, if you just bear with me a moment, I'm going to lead what, read what leads up to that. Romans 5, 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from what God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more... <laughs> How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God. I, it, it spoke to me because I'm, I'm a new Christian, as, as that goes. And <clears throat> what I got from a, lot of, from a lot of the study I was doing was, you know, it, a lot of us uh, are born again, we get out of that tank and we're, we're a new creation, right? And we have a new life in God and he promises salvation for us. But you read on, it says, not only is this so, not only are you saved, but God desires to have a relationship. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. Don't just be saved. He desires for you to boast in him, to be your friend, to be to be someone you turn to every day. And that's what I got out of this. And I would just encourage you, brothers and sisters, that don't stop where you're at. Don't stop where you're at. Keep striving to have a better relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when I got my verse, which was Psalms 9-1, Last week, I was like, oh, that's cute, God. Because it says, I'll praise the Lord with all of my heart. And I will tell of all the marvelous things he has done. And I was like, that's cute, God, because I'm a worship leader. Because yeah. yeah. God is all happy, fuzzy rainbows. But um, he knew at that moment that I needed that to get through the week this week. Um, yeah, he knew that I, uh, I need to be reminded to praise him through everything, that I can praise him for all of the marvelous things he's done, which is so much bigger than what I think I should be praising him for, which is selfish things. And that I need to praise him with my whole heart, not just the part um, that would make me happy the fuzzy, happy God that I thought he was supposed to be. And then that's when I would praise him and then I would be a stubborn child when he wasn't doing what I wanted him to do, which is so wrong. So God's not cute. He's awesome. <laughs> I got Philippians 1.11, 
filled with the right, fruits of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory and grace of God and praise. Um, this touched me personally. I work next door at Home Depot, and I do about 10 different people's jobs every day. And sometimes lately, I have been very out of sorts with people and I realized that I had to look at the fruits of righteousness and let Jesus's light shine out of me and I've been doing that this week and I have seen so many people responding with love back towards me so <laughs> he knew what I needed <laughs> oh. oh goodness I can't see how y'all do this every week? <laughs> okay, there we go. I had Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful because I didn't memorize mine. Amen. Okay, I know this is only my second time being here, and I, believe it or not, actually kind of enjoy being here, seeing all you positive people, and everything that y'all been saying is true, yes, and I don't have a particular scripture, but I want to say some things, though. Like little Donnie pointed out, you know, John 3.16, for God loved the world so much, he gave his only begotten son, and hopes that everyone exercising faith might not perish, but live forever in a new paradise earth. And it says in the Bible to keep seeking diligently the kingdom. Diligently the kingdom first, and you will find happiness. Give up all selfishness. Be there for people that need your help, even if they don't return it and, you know, return it back. You still did good. You make the Lord rejoice every time, you know, you make somebody's day whether it's a smile, friendly gesture, and Romans, I think it's, what is it, 12, 5, I think it is, through one man sin entered into the earth, and that was Adam, and the Lord gave us, He gave us free will. He told Adam, you can eat from every fruit of the garden, except one tree. And even though he was not the first to eat of that tree, Eve was, she was not the first one to sin. Adam is the one to sin because Adam is the one that was told directly by God himself to not eat from that tree of life and death. And he did, so sin entered into the world. And the reason being is because Satan the archangel, archangel Michael, I believe his name is, so Michael or Lucifer, he wanted all the glory that God was getting because of the fact that God created humans. He gave his breath through the nostrils of Adam. And he, he just is making, he's allowing time for us humans to draw close to Him, to become one with Him. And if you don't feel that, if you don't feel, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If you don't feel His Holy Spirit moving through you, it's hard. You know, He tells you, leave all your worries, your stress, everything is bothering you, look to Him. Ask Him for help. Amen. And He will help you. You just got to believe. You got to be there. You got you to trust. And even though you can't see Him, it's the unseen forces that He helps you with by sending, him, sending you His Holy Spirit Amen. that helps you to help other people, who helps you to see things from a different perspective. And after hearing all of y'all tonight, what y'all have to say, and what the scriptures have told you, 
I'm standing up here the first time ever in front of a crowd of people actually talking because I felt something move me to get out of my comfort zone and to speak what I'm speaking because I just feel that y'all need to hear this because y'all need to hear that it's not easy going through life. You have trials, you have tribulations, you know, but there's things that we can't control ourselves. No matter what the situation, nobody can control it. And that's what makes it hard. But what makes it even harder is when you have Satan and all his angels breathing down your back, throwing everything at you, throwing you curveballs, throwing you all these trials, tribulations. But the only way to answer that is to look up to God and ask God for help. Ask Him for that strength. Ask Him to help you. And He will help you if you just believe, you just trust. And you ask for His help through His Son that He did not have to give. He only sent His Son to buy us back from sin, to buy us back from all the evils, all the all the wickedness. He sent His Son to shed His blood to live a perfect life that Adam was supposed to have lived that Adam failed to do. So, in a sense, because Adam sinned, he left a dent in the pan that has been unre unrepairable. And Jesus came down from heaven to walk a perfect life. He did what Adam was supposed to do. But he did not do that. So Jesus had to come down. Brother, I'm going to put you on the preaching schedule, all right? I love you, man. Thank you. I'm going to give somebody else a chance, all right? Sorry, I carried away. Uh, no, it's all right. That's good. That's good. That's good word. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Come on. I went done. <laughs> I had Psalm 3.3, 3. but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. And when I think about the shield that's around me, that was placed around me at the moment I was saved, I think about God's mighty hand of protection and the word glory. When I think of that, so many things come to mind, um, like what it's going to be like when he returns, what it's going to feel like. You know, the word glory alone, it's even a hard word for me to describe. And when I think that that's what is surrounding me because of Christ's love for me, I, I'm just in awe. the one who lifts my head high. And that part makes me think about the sin in my life and the forgiveness that he gives. You know, just repenting and coming clean with it and knowing that you're forgiven and that you're able to hold your head high again. It just means so much to me. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Tom and I've been saved by grace for a few years now. Um, I am uh, want to say personally, thank you Lord for giving me a scripture that is very easy to go over. Uh, it's a two-parter, it says 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Well, uh, this is the really easy part because everybody that came up here just gave an example of that scripture. I would say that uh, I have been taught by a lot of people that I've never even heard talk before. Uh, I have been rebuked in different areas that uh, I realized that, yeah, okay, um, and definitely corrected. That's, uh, that's also humbling. 
And uh, especially, most importantly, I've been trained in righteousness. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I, I asked God several years ago um, to give me a teachable spirit. And the problem with asking God for something like that is, is he's going to humble you a lot. So, um, but the beautiful thing about that is he does give you a teachable spirit. And verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, just by the very little bit tonight, we probably have volumes of information that is going to train us and equip us to be uh, more powerful in our Christian walks. And, um, and this, this scripture applies to each and every one of us as Christians. Um, I know it's easy for all of us to, to think, um, you know, I'm just little old me, what can I do? Well, no, God specifically made each and every one of you on purpose. Every one of you has a purpose. Every one of you has been designed for greatness, to change the world in a unique way, to just do amazing, awesome things. Now, most of us, most Christians in history never do that. Um, but I want to encourage all of you, you are God's kids, the creator of this universe. You are his kids. He has adopted you, and you can't change that. So I want, I'm challenging all of you tonight, tomorrow morning, every day from here on out, look in the mirror and say to that person staring back, you were created by God on purpose. You were created by God, by Jesus, the Savior of humanity, the God of this universe, on purpose. He gave you something amazing that you are going to do. Just say something like that to yourself every morning. And I promise you, the more that you say that to yourself, the more you're actually going to believe it. And that's something that I can confidently say that you can believe and you can go forward with. Thank you, and God bless you all. Amen. My name's Robert, and bear with me. I'm about 1,000 years old. And <laughs> Moses gave me half of the New Testament to recite. <laughs> <laughs> My scripture verse was Colossians 1.22. It's, yet now, God has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, God has brought you to himself, and you are holy and blameless as you stand in his sight without any fault. Which, that kind of spoke to me personally, because I know over the years... I've been a Christian about what, some 15 years now, and I know over the years I've struggled personally with doubt. Not doubt that God exists, but doubt of my own salvation. I think everybody in this room has experienced that, if we're honest with ourselves. But that really spoke to me, and I felt like God was really, you know, wanting to make the point clear that you're there. It's settled. You know, you can get on with living your life for me. But beyond that, I think... Um, where God was meeting with me. And it really didn't hit me until just now, as a few other people were speaking, is just that how awesome that is to really, when you sit and really think about it, I'm holy and blameless. You're holy and blameless in his sight without a single fault. You have no fault. You're, you're in God's presence, holy and blameless without one fault. Perfect in his sight. Amen. Um, oh, that's hot. So I have Romans eleven thirty six, and it said, "All things were made by Him, all things were made for Him, and all things were made through Him, um, and for His glory and for His Majesty forever and ever." And um, it really spoke to me because I had been praying, um, because I told God that You've been a lot of things to me, but I've never made You my Lord. You know, I've allowed him to be Lord over certain areas in my life, but I wouldn't allow him to be Lord over my entire life. I wouldn't just surrender and say, my life is yours. Do with it as you may. Do with it as you will. And just in reading that and some cross references and some other scriptures, I was always looking for reasons why I should make him my Lord. You know, and well, he did this for me, so I guess I'll make him my Lord. And then if he does something else that's pretty good for me, then I'll make him a little bit more of my Lord. And in reading that, it was, wait, no, all things belong to him anyway. He's already Lord. He was telling me, I'm already Lord. You just have to decide if I'm going to be Lord over you. 
but your surrender doesn't change my lordship over this earth, over this universe. And so that's what I got this week. And it says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me shall not die, but live, even when dying. I know where my place is. I know what he does, because he did it for me. And all you have to do is just trust in him. Let him have his way for his will over your life. And he will take care of what he said he's already done. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Awesome. Now I really feel like preaching. <clears throat> Will you bear with me? Can I do that? Is that all right? That wasn't a very good answer. <clears throat> Does anybody, is anybody going to give me the permission slip other than Mike? It's still, wow. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, that was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. That is so good. So good. Thank you, everybody. Um, for those that were afraid to do it and felt that stir and I was scared and everything and you got up and broke through, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I want to I wanna spend, I, I just can't go, I just can't do it. I can't, so I got I to gotta do it. I can't go a week uh, without uh, sharing God's word with you. Um, so please uh, allow me the privilege. Uh, do me a favor and open up your Bible. Please open up a Bible. I try to keep it relatively short since we went long doing that. Uh, but open up a Bible. You have plenty of them. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't jip yourself, okay? Get a copy of God's Word in your hand. If you have to do it on a phone or a tablet, that's totally cool. But open up your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 8. We're going to jump right back in there. We've spent uh, the last part of 2016 kind of sliding into to home base, if you will, um, in, in the uh, pursuit of uh, Jesus Christ and his truth and trying to figure out who he really is and instead of, uh, you know, hearsay or rumor or gossip or anything like that. We want to know who Jesus Christ is, so we decided uh, for the last part of the year we're going to preach through uh, the Gospel of Luke and find out who Jesus is and, and what he taught and, and uh uh, what, he's do, what he's done and what he's going to do and what he's doing right now. We want to know who Jesus Christ really is. And so we ended the year doing that. Then we launched off into 2017, picking right up where we left off because we really wanted to make a statement that Jesus Christ is the central part of our ministry here at Revolution Church. So we end a year with Jesus. We, we begin a year with Jesus. That's just who we are, okay? We're a, we're a Bible church. We're a Jesus church. And so uh, Jesus said he's going to be building his church. I can see evidence here tonight, not only with who's here, but what's going on here, that Jesus Christ is building his church, and hell is not prevailing. We're winning. We're winning, okay? And so he's building his church, and he's doing that by, by um, encouraging us to worship him in spirit and in truth. See, we, we learn a lot about the truth of who God is, and that can, that can amp up our spiritual worship. We get a little bit more fired up, if you will, when you know who Jesus Christ is. When, when, the, when the reality of Christ falls upon you, you can't help but praise him. And so the more we understand who he is, the more we're loaded down with truth, the more fired up our spiritual worship can be. And he said that when we worship him like that, when we elevate Christ and we lift him up, he draws people to himself. And look, it's working. Great, great, great plan he's got. It's working. It's working. People all across the world 
Uh, Our learning about Jesus Christ, getting to know Jesus Christ by faithful servants who will climb mountains and and, and go across roads with with puddles, not puddles, but rivers to bring the word of God to these people, right? Awesome, awesome work. I thank you for doing that. So he's building his church, right? And, and, and he taught us uh, how to do that. So we've been spending the last couple of weeks uh, just preparing for this huge harvest that God wants to bring in in 2017. And I told you that I believe that 2017 is going to be the greatest year in the history of this church, that more people are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ through this church than in any year before, that more people will receive and believe the gospel through this church than ever before, and more people will be saved by the gospel than any year before, and more people will be wet than any other year in the, in the history of this church. We want to have a huge harvest. Are you guys with me on that? I want to see it. I want to see it. And I, you know, I spent years and years, and I know there's people in this room that have known me for years and years. And you know that I have been praying and hoping and wishing. And now we're in a season, what? Of seeing, right? That's awesome. So it's happening, and I love it. I'm excited about it. So Jesus, he, we took two weeks to see what Jesus said about this harvest. And he taught us the process in which this harvest would take place. Not catchy uh, catchphrases and advertising campaigns, but he said there's a way that there will be a huge harvest. And he talked about these different types of soils. Uh, in other words, these different types of people that, that, that God would use in different ways. And so there's this good soil person, right? And if you were here, and I I hope that you were here the last couple of weeks, or you might go, what in the world is he talking about? Well, that's not my problem. That's yours, right? You should have been here. Everyone that was here for those two weeks, say amen. Amen. All right, okay. So so, uh, there's this good soil person, and they would reap the harvest. That's who God would use to build his kingdom. These are the people that don't just hear God's word once or twice and no more. Uh, no, they cling to it, the scriptures said. They, they read it consistently, and they, they hear it over and over again. And as you did this week, you studied God's word. You didn't just read it, you studied it. Uh, you memorized it. You meditated on what it means to you over and over and over again. And by God's grace, you begin to obey it. So we all must choose what we'll do with this, with God's word. And let me tell you something, let me ask, there's some people in here that may have been asking, "Uh, God, please speak to me, and you want to hear that voice. I think it was loud and clear right here, tonight, right? How many people, how many people took home a verse that read their stinking mail? Come on now, right? Right, right, (laughs) he did. He's alive and well, and his word is alive, and and it's it's powerful, right? And so, uh, God's people, the good soil people, they will consistently uh, read and study and memorize and meditate God's word. And they will uh, be committed to coming to church. Listen, I'm not making excuses. Every weekend to hear the word of God proclaimed over you. Right? You have to put yourself in environments where, where God can build faith into you. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. How will they know unless they are what? told, right? So you have to be consistent privately in your own study of God's word and and committed to coming to church. We all have to choose what we're going to do with God's word. And Jesus, last week we saw him, we heard him really, he he made a a stern call to action in in Luke 8, 16, where he says, uh, don't, don't, don't cover the light that you received. You know, we, uh, we talked about cars operating as designed, and, and if you don't use the proper oil or the, or the right kind of gas or the right kind of parts, they won't operate correctly, right? You'll get a sputter and a hesitation or a backfire, right? You gotta, it, there's a certain way that the manufacturer has created this car to operate, and when you don't use the right tools and you don't have the right ingredients, it won't operate correctly, and we're like that. So, so if we're going to operate as designed, we were once in darkness, we didn't know where to go or what to do, and we're trying to fill the voids of life with all these things that don't work, and finally he opens up the light and he says, look at this is the way to live, and you're like, oh, I get it, and then you put a lamp over, a, a cover over the lamp so you can't see again. Who would do that? No one would do that. Well, people do that. And uh, that's why Jesus is talking about it, because people do it all the time. So we're at that place, this awkward, yeah, I want to see a huge harvest. I, 
I want to be a, a good soil guy so I could be part of this huge harvest. Use me, Lord. Uh, I, I want to do this, but uh, I get it, but. And so here come all the excuses and justifications, excuse, excuse, and rationalizing why we won't spend time in God's word, but God is calling you. God is calling you to a, to a high commitment to his word. And I, can only, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me and the leadership of this church. Revolution Church is heeding the call to a high commitment to the word of God. And we are committed to preach God's word without compromise week after week. Okay, but that's, that's us. But will you personally... Will you personally commit to consistent reading and studying and memorizing and meditating on God's word? And will you commit to consistently sit under the uncompromising teaching of this Bible teaching church? Will you do that? That's the good soil people. Those are the ones that the harvest will come through. Okay? Now listen, I didn't ask you those questions about Will you read and will you study and will you memorize and meditate and will you commit to coming and listening to the word of God every week? I didn't just ask you that like theoretically hypothetical question where you can go, hey, nice, nice word, preacher, and I don't care if you think it's a nice word. We have to have a holy pause. I'm asking you a question, right? I find that if, a, I'll just speak of men, I find that if a man doesn't say I'll do something, he won't. Right? And I'm sure that's probably for the ladies too, right? Yeah. You've you got to put some skin in the game, they say, right? So I'm going to ask you, like I'm not, I'm, I'm asking you to make a commitment. The Lord does not take pleasure in those who make a vow and don't keep it. But he's asking you to make a commitment. If you want a huge harvest, if you want to see thousands of people come to the Lord and worship him, you got to be good soil people. That means you got to commit to studying God's word. you got to commit to coming to church and hearing God's word proclaimed over you week in and week out. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. So if 216 wasn't all it should be in the Lord's kingdom in your life, maybe you need to do something different, yo. Right? So I'm asking you, Will you make a commitment right now? No, I want to hear it, not just Katie. Will you make a commitment, people? Make a commitment. Do something. Stand up for what you believe. Get married, man. Get married. Put a ring on your finger and say, I'm going to do this, Lord. I don't want to have the same group in my church next year. I want to see it quadrupled. I want to see people on their faces in weeping and, and, and repenting of sin. And changing their life. That's what I want to see. I don't want to be, I don't want the preacher to be the only pumped up, fired up freak in the house. I want to be a pumped up freak. Right? I think I got a freak over there. He, if I didn't cut him off, he'd be preaching all night. I love it. <clears throat> that was good. That was good. Make a commitment, man. That's the kind of church I want to be in. Committed people. Yeah, I'm com yeah. yeah committed. Yeah, they, we need. <laughs> We need to be committed. It's the place we're at right here, man. It's the place where choices are made. And the list of excuses is long. And I'm not here to make light of your excuse or your attempted justification of why you don't do anything with God's word. Nor am I here to, 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 to compile a list of viable ones. I'm not here for that. I'm here to herald someone else's standard, not my own. I'm here to take whatever rationale you might have and offer. And, and your rationale for, for not putting God's word in the place in your life that it belongs. And to take that rationale, that justification, that excuse, or whatever you want to call it, and I want to take it straight directly to Jesus Christ and let him determine its viability, not mine. doesn't matter what I think. I'm just a servant doing my duty, okay? So that being said, I want to read Luke chapter 8. And I want to start right here in verse 19. As we read that, you've got to know that these little breaks in Scripture are not divine. These are man-made efforts so that you can 
index things and know where they are and find them easily, right? So what happens is he's got this crowd of people and he starts teaching in parables, you know, simple lessons about farming and sports and things like that. That's what he'll do to, to illustrate a, a spiritual truth, something that everyone could kind of understand, like they're farmers so they'd understand farming terms, but not everybody gets it. And he preaches that way on purpose. But anyway, he starts teaching about these soils. And then right after that, he starts talking about, you got the light. No, don't put a cover over it. And I know what you're doing with God's word. He says, everything's going to come to the light. You might be fooling someone else, but you ain't fooling me. And then right then and there, it's, uh, the, the, the conversation continues. It's not like a whole new thing. It says, then, right then and there. As soon as verse 18 ends, then. Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. But they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. And we know that there was a huge crowd because in chapter 8, verse 4, where all this story begins, it says one day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns. So it's the same setting. And he's teaching about the soils. And in that same setting when he's calling you to a high commitment to God's word all of a sudden his mom his family shows up let's just say that I don't even know what ever happened to Joseph Joseph just disappears but but that's that's bad right dads don't disappear okay don't disappear but 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 listen his his family shows up right in the middle of this discussion where he's telling everyone to commit to the Lord by pursuing him through the study of his word. And he says, someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to see you. Now listen, when family calls, right? You're here in Florida, everybody wants to come see you. You're everybody's buddy because you live next to the rat. And so everybody wants to come to Florida, right? There's not a mass pilgrimage to Pittsburgh. They're coming here. So, so when family calls, right, what happens around here? Everything stops. Because mama's here. You won't be saying amen soon. I can tell you that. <clears throat> I can just tell you, in the time that I've been preaching, I can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, I'm not going to make it tonight. My family's in town. Do what you want with it. I'm preaching God's word. Okay? So, so that's exactly what happened to Jesus, right? Your family's in town. We're, spo we're supposed to be Christ-like. So Christ followers, what do they do? They follow Christ, right? They do as he does. They say what he says. They think as he thinks. They speak as he speaks, right? So uh, Jesus' family shows up. And Jesus replies, My mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> let's have some fun. Anyone opposed to fun in church? Okay. <clears throat> You're opposed to that? <laughs> Michael, Michael, Michael. <laughs> You're lucky your mom's like, there'd be a shoe flying right across that. <laughs> Okay, so, so you, get to, you get to, I want some, give me some excuses. Like, listen, not, not the, not the um, you can listen, you can throw out excuses of why people don't study God's word and go to church, and it doesn't have to be, like, don't do it to condemn, like, oh, I'm gonna get this guy next to me because I know why he didn't come last week. Like, don't, listen, just start throwing some stuff out. It could be, it could be the reason why you don't study God's word. It could be the reason why somebody else doesn't study God's word. So, but when you yell it out, no one's gonna know, right? No one's going to know. So, so what, give me, give me, just start yelling. Just yell. Time. Time. Oh, you're ready for some football. I think the Patriots are playing right now, right? That's pretty good that you guys have, that there's this many people here when the Pats are playing. I'm impressed with you. I really am. I'm not, not joking. That's pretty good. All right, what else? Patience. Hunting, work, what's that? 
Hard to understand. Hard to understand. The weather, huh? <laughs> what else? Huh? Tired? <clears throat> oh, yeah. What? Uh, what? Texting. What else? Like? Birthday parties. What did you just say? What was it up? It was a, someone said a parade. What else? Holidays. Can I pick on people? I think I may have already said this. Holiday, right? On Christmas. I know it's not Jesus' real birthday, but on his birthday, we had one person come to church. Okay, sad state of affairs. All right, go ahead. What else? Errands? Errands, busy. Oh, busy. What else? What? Concert? Whatever, anything, whatever. That you can get off to. You're off the hook. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Sick. <clears throat> okay, I'm running out of space. Thank you for your participation. <clears throat> A lot of things, right? A lot of things. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Don't tempt me. <clears throat> okay. So, so, so there's a lot of things here, right? What's that? Hot pastor. There's always room for that. Okay, no, so seriously though, okay. So, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things, and we could probably do this all night long, right? Be a lot of different things. What I'm, I'm really surprised that no one mentioned what we're talking about. Just by a show of hands, just, let's just make a vote. How many people in this room would believe that this priority probably trumps all the rest of them in your life. Just raise your hand. Family. Family. And I'm not just talking about your mom that comes out of town, but I'm talking about your child, your husband, your wife. I mean, family, right? So, so most of you raised your hand that family is probably the highest priority of all those things. Okay. So um, I just want to say this, that every culture is different. Um, whether it's where, where it is, or, or in what time period it, it was, okay? So in every different culture, the priorities, there's a shift. So in, in, in you know, ancient uh, Greece, uh, the, the, there wasn't uh, Facebook, right? And, and in Rome, uh, there wasn't football as like, you know what I mean? Okay, so, so these things might not always be in every single context, but in our world, they're here, and they're distractions, and, and, they're, and they're reasons why we don't spend time in God's Word, and why we won't commit to coming to God's house to hear God's Word proclaimed over you, okay? But let's just take a moment to evaluate the culture that this text that we just read was, was written to and, and in, okay? This was ancient Israel. This was, this was the Hebrews of the Bible. This is a long time ago. And, and, and back then, uh, your family and the lineage of your family, the ancestry was numero uno in importance, okay? It, 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 it formed your identity of who you actually were. Um, it, it, it determined your social status, 
Um, it, it determined most often your vocation, what you did for, uh, for work, for a living. And it also determined uh, what religion you were and what participation in religious activities that you were involved in. People were identified not only by name, but they were also identified by name and son or daughter of, okay? That, that's, that's the way it was. That's the way it is all throughout the biblical text. Uh, places like Genesis 5, Genesis 10, uh, Genesis 36, Genesis 46, Exodus 6, Numbers 1 and 2, Numbers 26, Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3. All extensive, extensive writing on the ancestry of family groups and who begat who and who begat who, where they came from. That, that was a huge thing. Blood family and, and ancestry was a big deal in ancient Israel. It was a huge priority in their day. And Jesus Christ in that context, in that environment. Now remember, he's a Jewish rabbi. And he speaks directly to the Jewish people who put this first. And he looks at them right in the eye and he says to them, my family are the ones who uh, read God's word and obey it. Can you, I mean, think about that for a second. In his culture, who he's, who he's talking to when he says this, right? And remember this, his mom is there. For all of you that are afraid of your mom, his mom was there. His brothers were there. And he looks directly into this thing and he confronts it with these words. The ones who hear God's word and obey it, that's my family. So you notice the, the focus on the singular criteria of God's family. These are my family, the ones who hear God's word and obey it. Now listen, Jesus Christ is not downing families. Don't you think Jesus loved his family? Right, of course. He's not downing the value of family or yours. He's simply increasing the value of God's word. He's offering a proper perspective for you. That's the way you are to live. So don't allow the good things to trump the best and the highest thing. Jesus addresses the, the, the greatest rationale for not pursuing God's word and God's church, right? This right here, this is the greatest reason of the, the highest weight, so that if you can see, family. This has, got the, this has got the most weight to it. When they call, my parents are coming in town. My family's coming in town. I can't come. Right here, the most important thing. And, and Jesus addresses that right then and there. And he addresses the greatest justification so that we can easily know how all other possible reasons should be prioritized. Like, because if this isn't the most important thing, well, then certainly, right, and certainly these cannot be either. Because this is more important than texting. And this is more important than football. And, and this is more important than a parade. So, so if this isn't the most important thing to Jesus, these clearly are not. And you need to reprioritize your life. Amen? Okay. So Jesus is clear here to teach them and us that what you do with other things is not nearly as important as what you do with the word of the Lord. In the, in the story of the, the soils, he talks about the cares and the riches and the desires of this world. All things that God has given you, right? What do you have that you have not received? If you have not received it, why would you boast as if you have not received it? All good and perfect gifts come from above and come down from the Father, right? So everything you have, all the things that you should care about in life, that he gave you, right? You should care for your family, right? You should care about your, your finances. Like, don't be a bad steward, be a good steward. Don't just blow it on stupid stuff. You should be responsible, right? You have a nice house? Anyone in here feel like they have a nice place? I feel like I have a nice place, right? You should take care of that thing. It's a pleasure. It's a rich, right? If, if I could use that term. It is a rich, all right? And we should take care of those things. But those things cannot be number one. God's word is number one. The other things are number two. And I didn't mean it like that, but you know what I'm saying. 
Actually, the scriptures would say that, right? Paul says that. I consider it all done. I just got that. That was really good right there. So, so, but seriously, like family is important. And it's very, very important. Family in today's America is probably not as elevated in importance as it was to the ancient Hebrews, but still, no doubt, very, very important. Now, I love my wife, and I love all of our children, and I love my mom, and, and I love my family. And like I said, absolutely, you guys all agree, Jesus loved his mom, right? Absolutely loved his mom, loved his brothers, loved his dad, Joseph, his stepdad, if you will. He loved his family, no doubt about it. But see, there's this issue that I, here's an issue I've had since, since I became a Christian, and maybe you guys have felt this too. I'm just going to bring it out into the light. And it usually fleshes out when the people are, when Christians are praying. Do you ever hear anyone pray and they're like, you know, they're, they're, doing, they're doing good, it's good prayer, right? And, and they, they say, Lord, thank you for my, for my family, and they start listing off their family, and, and then they say, and thank you for my church family, right? And then they go on. Did anyone ever, ever, ever hear that? Thank you for my church family. I never wondered why church family always came second. I just never quite understood why church family came second. And I've had a hard time, listen, you could pray for me, but I've had a hard time when I see people leave our church for reasons, let's just say, kind of unimportant. They wouldn't leave their, their blood family for those reasons, but they'll leave their church. A couple extra hours, a couple extra dollars an hour, they're gone. They don't like the time of the service, they're gone. Preachers preaching too long, they're gone. The songs are, are, are not the way you like it, they're gone. They don't like the way the chairs were, they're gone. All these different reasons why they leave a church. But I think that Jesus Christ put the priority into the church family even above your blood family. I mean, I'm just, I'm not making anything up, am I? I mean, it's right there in the text, right? I'm not making anything up. And I've struggled with that. It seems like church family is a level two, but not to Jesus Christ. See, if you've been born again, then you have a new family. A, a family that is, that is marked by the ingesting of God's word. That's an identification mark of your new family. And, and, and these people in this family, they, they take time. They make time for God's word. God's word is a staple in the diet of the true follower of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, I don't have much time for reading the Bible. You know, I, I, what about time with my wife? It's good. What about time in God's word? Now, what, what about sports with my kids? What about time in God's word? What about yard work? I got a honeydew list, man. I got to get this thing done. I don't want my place to look nice. You should. But what about God's word? What about work? I got to make a living, right? I got a career. I got to work, 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 work. What about God's word? What if the tide rolls? <clears throat> Roll tide. I'll tell you what, it doesn't make any difference if they win or lose. It won't ensure a good, purpose filled life if they win. Uh, being a good husband won't ensure a good life either. You know that old expression, happy wife, happy life? <laughs> That's not the truth. Taking your kids to soccer isn't going to ensure a good life either. And working a ton to make money never ensured participation in God's harvest of souls. But God's word's pretty clear of what is the most important thing. You can see all those things that I just listed are, are good things. They're, but they're byproduct things. They're things that come as part of your benefit package. If you're a good husband, that doesn't necessarily mean you're an awesome Christian. And if you're a good husband, it doesn't mean you're actually going to participate in, the harv in God's harvest of the souls advancing his kingdom. If you take your kids to every single soccer game on God's green earth, by the way, they're never going to make it, most likely. Okay, so you're, you're, you're going crazy, going crazy to every soccer game, just telling them that it's more important than coming to church. So that's awesome work. But I'm telling you, if you do those things, that doesn't ensure a happy life. But if you spend extensive periods in God's word, 
you will become a good dad. If you spend extensive periods of time in God's word, you will become a good wife. If you spend extended periods of time in God's word, you will be God's soldier and he will use you to advance his kingdom. That's where the priority has to be, spending time in God's word. And let me, t- let me give you a scripture that speaks clearly to this. There's absolute clarity in what I'm trying to tell you. Found in Joshua 1.8. Please go there. Okay? Joshua 1.8 will speak with clarity. I'm going to ask after we uh, get through with this verse, I want the worship band to come up. And I want, I I, I don't know what you guys are planning on doing, but I'm hoping, can I make a request? (laughs) The one you didn't do? He deserves it all. Okay? Okay? He deserves it all. Right? He, he, Jesus Christ, deserves all of you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to sing that in a minute, but listen. Here's God's word, okay? Joshua 1.8 speaks with absolute clarity. It says, study this book of instruction. It's in your hand, guys. Well, 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 when? Because, right, I got, I got, I don't have the time and I got a football game and, and, and I, and I don't have patience for this and I've got to get up on my tree stand and hunt. I don't even know why that's hunting. You're not even moving. Work. I got a lot of work. I, 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 hard to understand it. I, it's, it's cold outside and I'm sleepy and, 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 you know, deaf leopards come into town and so I don't have time for all these different things, right? Okay. Well, he says, study this book of instruction, this Bible, continually. So we're supposed to st- not just read it, but what it, study it, which you guys did this week. Meditate on it day and night. Right? Bible reading plans are not what God suggests. He says study it continually and meditate on it day and night, all the time. No, you might ask, why would I do such a thing? I understand that's a valid question because what what I'm asking on behalf of the Lord is for you to step up to this high commitment to God's word and do something that is way, way out of your comfort zone. I don't want to spend all day reading this. I don't want to meditate on what I read all day and night while I'm working, stuff like that. I don't want to do all that. And if you're asking me to make that massive commitment, there must be a massive reason why you're asking me. Okay, well, God is good. He says, meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it, right? That's, a, that's important. You want to live a righteous life. You want to represent Christ well. The only way to do that is to spend time in the word and you watch how your life changes. But then here's the clincher. Here it is. You ready? This is, this is awesome. Now keep in mind as I'm about to read this, think about being a good husband. Think about being a good wife. Listen to me. Don't look around. Think about being a good wife. Think about being a good husband. Think about being a good dad. Think about being a good employee. Think about being a good employer. All those things you want to do and you want to give yourself to those things, right? Now listen. If you will study the word of instruction continually and meditate on it day and night, only then, like there's no other way, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. See, if you want to be a good dad, meditate on God's word. If you want to be a good wife, you meditate on God's word. If you want to be a good boss, meditate on God's word. If you want to be part of the harvest of him bringing in souls to advance his kingdom, you got to meditate on God's word. you got to study, study it continually. So here we are. At that place. The place of choice. The place of priority. The place where you decide what you're going to do with God's word. It's a new year. So forgetting the past, right? Maybe last year you didn't spend as much time in God's word. But I guarantee you, if you didn't, you're probably thinking, you know what? My year didn't go as good as it could have. Right? So make a different choice. 
Will, will you believe in God's word? Will you believe what it says? We're free will. Will you choose to cling to it? Will you study it? Will you memorize it? Will you meditate on it? Will this thing with God's word be a season or, a, or just a fad? Or will you consistently, or will consistency and commitment mark your relationship with this life-giving, hope-infusing, soul-reviving, joy-inducing word of the Lord? It's time to choose. It's time to choose. No more lukewarm. No more on the fence. No more procrastinating. No more beating around the bush. Make a choice. The harvest is plentiful. And God will bring in this harvest, listen, only, only through those who make much of his word. Amen? Now listen, there's two ways I'd like to offer you right now that you can make much of his word. One, you can commit to it. You can commit to spending time in his word daily. You can commit to doing what you did this week, and that is studying his word and meditating on his word, letting it speak to you so you can grow and advance in your relationship with the Lord, and he can use you for greater things. And many of you said you'd commit to that. But here's another way you can make much of the, of the word. You can obey it. You can obey it. I don't know everybody in this room tonight for sure. But I'm going to tell you something. The word of the Lord says, when Peter preached the gospel, and people said, I want that. They said, I want that. He told them about the good news of Jesus Christ and how God sent his son so if you believe in him, you'd be saved and have everlasting life. And so the people said, well, what do we do? He said, believe and be baptized. If you want God to do great things in your life, great things through your life, you have to start with obeying in the little things. You gotta take your first step before you can finish the marathon, right? And so I just wanna tell you, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He is the only way to have everlasting life in heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. And so I'm giving you the opportunity right now to make much of his word that was just spoken and say yes to that. If you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and be a part of his family once and for all, stop putting it off. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and say, I want to do that. I'm talking about people, hey, I love you guys. I'm talking about people who have never said yes before. Anyone in here, you want to say yes to Jesus? First time ever, making him Lord and Savior of your life right now? Awesome, right? Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, he says believe and be baptized, right? You want to do great things for God? Let's do something little for God. Let's be obedient to his word. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, baptism doesn't save you, but it's obedient. He said, believe and be baptized. And so I'm just telling you right now, that tank right there is filled with nice warm water in preparation for your yes tonight. And so if you want to be baptized and be obedient to the word of the Lord, you can come forth right now and we'll do it. Okay? Come on. Come on, brother. <clears throat> come on, right? <clears throat> awesome. <clears throat> awesome. <clears throat> Come on, brother. <clears throat> I want uh, Robert, please. Dan, please. Could you come here? What's that? We don't. <clears throat> come here, young man. <clears throat> you got anything in your pockets? Money? Well, you just leave that right there, son. Go ahead. <clears throat> Want to take your shoes and socks off? Come on, you can't go in there like that. Leave your pants on, but you guys mind if he takes his shirt off? That's cool, right? 
So we'll have something dry to wear? Cool? Or do you want to leave it on? You want to leave it on? All right. Come here, guy. What's your, tell everybody what your name is. Donnie. This is Donnie. So you made a decision right there to say yes to Jesus? It's awesome. All right. Awesome. Why don't you do me a favor? Here, you're, here go around the back here. There's a little step right there. You can step right in here. He don't want him off. You want him off? All right. Come on now. You're good. He don't care. That's the boldness I love right there, man. He don't care. You got nothing else? No cell phones or nothing in them pockets? Awesome. You want to sit? You want to sit? Come on, guys. Let's put our hands on this, on this young man. Slide forward a little bit. Slide forward a little bit right there. Awesome. Let's pray. You guys want to pray with me for the... What, what's your name again? Donnie. Donnie what? Pool. Donnie Pool got in the pool. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Come on. Let's pray for Donnie Pool right now. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's clear. We thank you that it's bold. And we thank you for the boldness of Donnie right now. Lord, we thank you for his boldness to come forth before people he doesn't even know and to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I want to be saved. And I want to be obedient. Lord, let this child, he is a child, but let him be an example to us of what childlike faith looks like, unashamed and unafraid to proclaim to the world that Jesus Christ is his Lord. And so I've said it, but I want to ask you, who is your one and only Lord and Savior? Jesus. Because of that confession, I now bury you with Christ. And like him, you'll be raised a new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Down. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Come on now. Get to your feet now, right? Come on. Get to your feet. And let's worship Jesus Christ. He deserves all of your worship. You heard truth tonight, right? You're infused with truth. So let your spirit flow. Come on now.